It's ad break time. The Beyond Solitaire podcast is proudly sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations, which, as usual, has amazing things going on. They continue to run courses in applied game design in partnership with Gen Con. And next up is Travis Hill's Finding Your Niche, expanding your skill set across five different gaming genres. It starts May 16th, so register soon. I also want to put in a plug for Cartini from Darkness to Light, a game by Zenobia finalist Sharia Iwandini that will be published by Ion Game Design. CMU is partnering with ION to publish a curriculum guide, which will be authored by the amazing Christiane Hintz. Cartini is set to launch on Kickstarter on May 23rd. And finally, a quick plug for myself. If you like my game work and want to see more of it, support me at patreon.com slash beyondsolitaire. It would mean a whole lot to me. For now, though, let's get on with the show. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson of Beyond Solitaire, and this week I have a very special guest. This is Dr. Josh Hartman. He's a visiting assistant professor of classics at Bowdoin University. Uh, how you doing, Josh? Hello, um, I'm well, and I feel like I should, I don't know, I should do Bowdoin a favor and mention that Bowdoin is actually Bowdoin College, oh, um, there you go. not Bowdoin University, well, but thank you. <laughs> I, I always figure you just go up instead of down if you forget. Uh, but um, so you are doing a game about Greek, which is one of the things I brought you on to talk about. And then we're going to talk about some reception study stuff later in the interview. For those of you who are interested in Puerto Rican reception of classical literature, uh, but let's talk about your game first. What, uh, what's your game and what, what inspired you to make it? So um, when I began teaching, um, so I should say that this isn't something that I'm actively using at the moment, um, not because, um, well, for no other reason that I'm just not teaching in the Greek sequence right now. Um, but when I arrived at Kalamazoo College in 2017, I knew that I was going to um, be asked to teach the Greek sequence for all of my time there. And I, I had a, a relatively long short-term contract. Um, that is to say, I knew I was probably gonna do this for multiple years in a row. And when I got on campus, I noticed that there was a pretty robust um, gaming culture among the students, especially students who were interested in ancient history and classics. There was a lot of reacting to the past um, in the history department across different um, specialization, so not only in ancient and medieval history, but then also a little bit in U.S. history um, as well. Um, and so that led me down the path of trying to think about what a classroom game that could uh, that could exist across the entirety of an introductory sequence in an ancient language might be like. Um, so I began developing uh, Olympus, this board game. Uh, set in sort of an ahistorical ancient Greece. And I can talk about what I mean by that as we go forward in terms of what ahistorical is supposed to be. Yeah, actually, uh, we just had Kate Cook come on to talk about um, classics and, you know, women in classical video games. So thinking about, you know, authenticity versus historicity versus accuracy, you know, yeah, I, I actually am sort of curious about that. Um, but this is mostly a game about language, correct? Yeah, so um, to um, break it down into its really its most basic parts, uh, what I wanted was a flexible game-based structure that would allow students to use language skills while also exploring some of the history and culture side of ancient and Roman and even medieval uh, Byzantine Greece that is that is bringing students into the classroom and uh, over the course of such a long history of 2000 years of Greek culture there's no way to to do that to sort of hit all of these diverse things and so one way to get around this problem of content selection is to make it random um, and in so doing, students sort of experience, you know, there are different cards and different events and different monsters that are from different mythologies or different historical time periods or different cities. 
Um, and so this is this a historical thing where it's odd uh, in, in other contexts maybe to encounter something from the later Roman Empire and from classical Athens um, or from Constantinople and Sparta in the same 20 minutes. Um, but this was a framework that would permit that on the content side while also focusing on uh, different aspects of uh, sort of language learning reinforcement, different paradigms can come into play. Uh, so to give a concrete example here, like um, many of many of your listeners might be familiar with what a verb synopsis is in an ancient language where you uh, basically give a ton of different forms as completely as you can, depending on where you are in your knowledge of the language uh, for different um, for different parts of a verb form. So like every second singular U form you can think of, for example, or something like this, not just hanging out there by itself to do, which is a common kind of assignment, but instead put into the context of the Spartan um, agoge, the, the training regimen uh, for Spartan male um, citizen children, sort of much romanticized in various forms of popular media sometimes. Uh, but anyways, to sort of introduce what that is, through this grammar task. And then of course your, your character who you're following through this game gets some kind of benefit if they can do it. So did you find that your students were receptive to uh, playing a game instead of just doing a normal verb synopsis? Or uh, do you have the ones who are more like, ah, I'll just sit here and memorize this, leave me alone. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the short answer is yes. And the survey data that I collected indicates that too. Um, but the, you know, in this, in the spirit of what I've been talking about before, right, that is a random event that, that came up when someone landed on Sparta and they, they rolled a 20 sided die and that's the random event that happened to them because of that dice roll. Um, and then they also learned this cultural fact. And so one of the things that I was trying to get at when I mentioned this idea of a flexible framework that does a lot of things is. Um, you know, different students have different learning goals, um, and some of those are content driven. So if somebody's really interested in ancient Sparta, um, that might feel very successful for them, um, in spite of whatever happens on the synopsis. Um, and that's important as well. And then, of course, there are language related goals. And so maybe you don't care about Sparta at all. Um, and maybe you mentioned you have a background in early Christian studies. If you're there to read the New Testament, the Spartan sort of uh, rapper, uh, that that comes in is is maybe not exciting to you, um, but it could be later on um, when there is uh, the parable of the publican, which is also like one of the cards that comes up. Um, anyway, so yeah, um, the other thing about that too is one thing that was important to me um, in terms of creating this framework was this idea, okay, your character is going on this journey and they progress and get stronger as, as you might expect um, in a lot of the, the narrative of many gaming experiences. Uh, but one thing that I wanted to do with that is turn it into an opportunity for reflection. That's sort of the development of a growth mindset in the class. So there were uh, rappers um, that were attached to, uh, this is a concept ripped off from the idea of exam rappers, where you take an exam and and afterwards you kind of have like a little mini survey where you talk about it. And what I did was um, ask them to sort of reflect on their experience playing the game of things they got right, of things they got wrong, of the progress that they were making. And I think it's a, it's a different thing entirely to ask students to do that kind of as you're indicating, like what's their, what's their affect towards this just by itself. And then as making it kind of a game-based exercise um it i hope it's my hope there that it feels more more fun more engaging to do this kind of um mindset and reflection and progress reflection if it is also even somewhat transparently tied to this idea of oh my character is whoever um achilles i have i've had multiple achilleses over the years uh, so they also pick a character and decide why this character is um why this character is on this this journey um and um 
oh yeah, that hopefully that idea is slightly more, or rather slightly less intimidating, is slightly more approachable or less intimidating, depending on how we want to go about this, um, <laughs> because it is connected to a sort of game-based experience. And then you also have different groups of students who uh, play this together. Um, and I think that that's also fun um, and successful in certain ways. There are also various mechanisms for uh, student input. Uh, for instance, there's a Delphic Oracle um, experience where students are supposed to make up prophecies for each other um, and then decipher them. <laughs> uh, and so um, there is, as I think you're suggesting, a motivation based element for this um, that it might incentivize, for example, different kinds of um, different kinds of studying or a different disposition um, towards um, some of this, um, some of the sort of very grammar focused practice that students are often asked to do in introductory language classrooms of ancient languages in particular. Yeah, I'm, I'm also interested in this because so I'm a comprehensible input Latin teacher, which means that we do very little grammar based stuff in the first couple of years. And in fact, spend a lot of time interacting the language. So I'm always just really interested in, um, you know, how are we all engaging our students? How are we all playing games with our students? And so like, this is kind of an interesting implementation of that. And then I, you actually started to answer a question that I had, which was, um, you know, how do you target subject matter for your students and how do you choose what goes into the game and what doesn't? And it sounds like you've created something where you have a lot of game to game selection and control over what goes in and what does not. Yeah. So the idea, I mean, I didn't uh, maybe set this part up as um, meticulously as I could have partially because I wasn't sure how much of the nuts and bolts you wanted, but uh, there is a deck of different sort of grammar paradigm based questions that they have to draw from at various times when sort of challenges arise within this game world. Um, and that is all pegged to whatever the chapter, whatever the grammatical um, concepts in the chapter we're working on is, or the last two chapters, depending on exactly how the timing shakes out. Um, so um, I'm not 100% sure I answered the question there, um, but it's, you know, it's, it uh, is according to sort of what they've been doing in the textbook is sort of the paradigms or vocabulary that are sort of then brought into the game world. And so every week you add more, just like every week you add more um, in an actual, in an actual classroom experience where you're incrementally building on whatever has come before. Right. So it sounds like actually you answered my question and added information, which is so we talked about different cultural facts appearing, uh, but also it's adaptable in terms of like which vocabulary points and which grammar points you want to hit, um, which makes sense. How often do you play when you play? Is this like something that you're playing often or do you find that it's got better effect if you just kind of trot it out every month, every two months? Depends on your students, I guess, but... Yeah, so I was teaching on a 10 week quarter system. And so we would do this like mm, about every two, two to two and a half weeks. So in a given term, students would probably play this game like five times um, between four and five times. Yeah. Um, and then across the second term of the sequence as well, the first two introductory terms. So not that frequent, but sort of enough to um, really sort of, you know, as we were talking about, sort of take a character through a bunch of different tests and trials and so on. Um, and yeah, to interact with different times, different uh, locations throughout sort of the wider Greek world. Um, yeah. So uh, out of curiosity, um, did you come up with that idea for uh, this game because you are yourself a gamer? And if so, what is your what does your personal gaming life look like? And then, you know, what made you decide to bring into the classroom? Um, I the short answer is kind of um, that is to say, I don't find a lot of time to to play games 
anymore. Um, but I did, um, and I have fond memories of uh, you know all the people in in my during my time as an undergrad who would play uh, Settlers of Catan with me and. Uh, Republic of Rome, which may be near and dear to the hearts of many in this podcast, uh, one of the only games where there was assigned homework uh, before we could ever start playing it because it was such a complex um, board game. Yeah, um, I'm actually starting up a game of it. Uh, so we're recording on March 13th for those of you out there. This will come out weeks later, but we're starting a game on the Ides actually on Wednesday night. So, <laughs> oh, well, that's fitting. Exactly. Um, and yeah, so I mean, there were there were um, this was directly inspired in a lot of ways by um, Talisman and Prophecy, um, uh, two games that are sort of relatively similar to one another in terms of their um, their sim their really simplified sort of like we're going adventuring on a board kind of. Um, um, framework. Uh, one of my students once described it as a D and D on rails, um, <laughs> which is pretty accurate for the way that those types of games function. And that's precisely one of the things that attracted me to it is just you roll a six sided die and then that's how you move every once in a while. After you do that, other things will happen based on cards and the information is all on these cards. I, I didn't want them to have to do the do the thing you have to do if you want to play Republic of Rome, which is is go through that very intense. And of course, that's an unfair example because that game is extremely complex. But the sort of the first principle as far as design being informed by my own experience playing games in the past was how can this be made as simple as possible um, so that there's very little time wasted in terms of or rather time spent I don't mean to imply that it would be wasted. Um, very little time spent onboarding anyone into, into an experience like this, which is especially valuable too if people add midterm or they test into the second semester right. or they just miss that day. Um, it's so much better if it just takes five minutes um, to kind of explain how it's working. Um, so this leads me to another question too. Um, and then I actually want to talk about reception because I can't help myself but uh has playing one game in your classroom uh led you to want to play others uh and if so how do you how would you want to implement them um yes and I should say um there are other shorter games that are that are far less complex that require far less input uh, from from me um that also show up in my classroom a venerable classics uh, like Simon says, uh, which is, you know, one of the best ways to teach the imperative that has ever come down to us. Um, and, and, and other, uh, other things too, uh, you know, there are some things from uh, different colleagues in modern languages, which I have, uh, which I've borrowed as well. Um, um, for like vocabulary, for example, uh, type of exercises and so on, where you're, you know, uh, walking up to the board and then at once you're both there, people get a word and then, you know, et cetera, uh, you have to produce the English version of it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, um, maybe this has come up before, um, but, uh, you know, the, the, um, our sort of pedagogical ancestor, uh, Quintilian, uh, also really believed in sort of classroom games, um, and 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 talked about how breaks were really good, and you you know you needed to kind of refresh your refresh your mind. Um, um, I think that's that's what he says. Um, and um, yeah, the other thing about that too is, um, as I was saying, there are, there are different ways that games help students experience success, and there's good research to suggest that success is a really important um, component of uh, retention and engagement, and that success is defined as progress towards a goal. In a lot of these psychological, pedagogical research literatures, um, and that goal does not always have to be um, related to the grammatical 
task. That is to say, there's also evidence to suggest that progress towards a goal, which is um, peripheral, um, is also valuable. And that's one of the reasons why I chose this game-based framework is you could still have a good time um, doing this. You could still feel like you were making progress, even though there would be times where you've completely forgotten what the data of, of third declension nouns should be like or whatever. <laughs> um, and similarly, um, a lot of these content-driven things are also success-related. Like if, if you've come if you've come to the Greek classroom because you really want to read the New Testament and we spend 100% of our time talking about Demosthenes, you're not going to feel like you're making progress towards that goal, even though you really are, uh, because a lot of those words are going to show up. <laughs> um, and if you really want to, you know, if you really want to read, I don't know, uh, um, Herodian, um, showing my my late antique uh, bias here. Um, and and all we do is read the New Testament, you might not feel like you're making progress towards that goal because you're, you're really invested in the world of the later Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire or classical Athens. Um, and so um, this was a way to, to sort of, um, one, to build in some opportunities for that, but also to show that I was open to these different areas of uh, Greek history and sort of uh, the, the life of the language beyond whatever the textbook was giving to do a better job or do a more comprehensive job rather of sort of presenting myself as a resource or at least a co-conspirator uh, because or, or whatever the proper term is there a collaborator in finding out some of these things because I certainly can't claim to have a great knowledge of the 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 court of uh you know constantine i don't know what he is constantine the ninth porphyrogenitus <laughs> the one everyone always talks about <laughs> um uh, but i uh, i'm i am very eager to have that conversation um um or about anyone else you might care to name that is not always there in the world of the greek of the greek uh introductory textbook indeed yeah i sort of feel like um it's 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 not that you have to know everything, it's that you have to know where to get everything. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great way of, of putting it um, in as much as like, I would, I would love for them to come and ask me more about where can I get X. Um, and sometimes I think the, the textbook doesn't always suggest that your instructor is a resource for that or wants to help you find that or might, might, even, might even know um, xyz thing that you're interested in right so this uh this leads me into uh what you are a fantastic resource resource for uh which is your research into puerto rican classical receptions you've given several talks on this topic and um first of all you know what what led you to um to this as a major branch of your work and uh where are you at with it now because i guarantee you i don't know anything about this and my audience will probably be interested as well so so uh, while I was writing my dissertation, a friend of mine advised me to have a sort of vacation project. Uh -huh. And this advice was motivated by the idea that, you know, while you're working on finishing your dissertation, you know, you will spend, you will pour countless hours into extremely small, ex not small, but extremely detailed um, points, you know, you can, you can sit down to write for an hour and, and realize that what you're going to kind of come away with is the undoing and redoing and eventual deletion of a paragraph or of a footnote. And that can be really frustrating. And so what this person was saying is you should find something that you want to learn about and sort of pursue the joy of, of learning, um, of researching something for its own sake because you're kind of not going to be able to do that in the same way while you're um, while you're working really intensely on this one project. And um, the thing that I wanted to learn more about, uh, I took this this friend up on his advice, uh, was the revolutionary era in Puerto Rico. Uh, I have a heritage connection to Puerto Rico. My grandfather was born there. My mother was was born there when my grandfather was in the Air Force. Um, um, and he, my grandfather, was was born there um, after generations of of living there, and we're not actually sure just how far back that goes. Uh, my brother tried to find out, um, 
but he didn't he didn't make it much much past the 1830s. Um, but anyway, um, uh, so I began just sort of learning about different figures in this history, and what I came to learn is that many of them were also poets, um, and were informed um, by readings of Greek and Latin. Uh, literature. Um, and so the one that I have worked the most extensively on is uh, Ramon Betances, who uh, was responsible uh, for planning and uh, executing um, a very brief uh, insurrection against um, Spanish power in the 1860s, um, uh, the so-called Grito de Lares, where there was an independent republic of Puerto Rico that was proclaimed, but uh, as I recall, um, and the history here is not entirely, um, I can't claim to have perfect recall to this, but as I recall, um, Spanish forces discover this, um, and it's a, it's around 30 days that this revolt actually lasts. Betances escapes, um, and meanwhile, he is uh, back in France, uh, where he had um, been educated. His mother was um, French. Um, and there's a big community of Franco Puerto Ricans. Anyway, a bunch of his poetry is in French, um, and a bunch of his a bunch of his poetry um, that engages uh, classical authors is in French, um, including one of his longest poems, which is a sort of a reflection on Roman love elegy, uh, Amoureux de Poètes, um, the love of poets. Um, and one of the interesting things that struck me about that is he seems to be connecting to that tradition through uh, Pierre de Ronsard, which makes perfect sense uh, because he's writing in French. Uh, but it's also interesting for him to sidestep Spanish in this way. And then uh, probably the most interesting thing he's done, which I hope to approach someday, is he actually does this in the United States, the Revolutionary Committee of Puerto Rico. Um, is based in the United States, uh, in New York, uh, at various periods throughout its history. Batansis is in contact with um, many of its um, leaders and is himself one of them. And he deposits in the New York Public Library an alleged translation of the Alularia, um, but it isn't a translation. It is an adaptation very clearly. Um, or at, you know, so it appears. There hasn't been a lot of scholarship on this, and as I understand it, we still it still exists. The manuscript still exists, um, and so I'd I'd really like to dig into that. And then beyond that, there is also there are also two other poets that are incredibly worthwhile to mention in the same breath um, as Betances, even though I haven't worked on them as much. Uh, one is Lola Rodriguez Etio, who is uh, famous for writing the revolutionary version of the national anthem. Um, so there was a version of the national anthem that of the Puerto Rican national anthem, the Lord in Kenya, that existed before it was sort of changed um, after um, American military occupation and American military governments in the in the 20th century. In the 19th century, there's a different version. She writes it. That's probably one of her most famous sort of poetic contributions. But her corpus is extremely vast and replete with different references to. Uh, classical authors and themes. And then alongside her, there is um, Luis Munoz Rivera, who the story of that generation of Puerto Rican leaders can sort of be told through these three poets um, because um, Lola and Batances are revolutionary independent uh, independentist actors who participate in this coup d'etat and it's sort of um, planning and eventual government. Um, there, uh, Munoz Rivera is an autonomist and secures as part of the political um, alliance on the island that secures autonomous self-rule within the Spanish system. And all of this is, of course, uh, blown to smithereens after um, the war in 1898 and occupation of Puerto Rico by the United States military. Um, but before that, there was actually an agreement that was put in place that Puerto Rico would be self-governing um, and would be kind of an overseas uh, territory of Spain. Um, and Munoz Rivera was one of these poets, uh, or excuse me, one of these politicians, but he was also a poet. So he has a lot of poetry uh, about um, this change 
um, between sort of the dream of autonomy, which he cherished, even though he was um, at odds with many of these other politicians who I've just mentioned, um, and then also the sort of reality of living under the American military government in the early 20th century. And in addition to this, he also talks about um, the reception of the classical tradition and how it can work. And, you know, among all of these poets, in terms of where one might hope to go, I'm not sure that I, I will be the person to do this, um, uh, but it seems uh, like one of the things that's going on and that you see in other national literatures at this time is the sort of, this is becoming a very long answer, isn't it? No, I love uh, it. <laughs> this sort of I, the, uh, the impetus to kind of create a national culture ethos um, uh, from interaction with the classical past um, in, in various ways. And what that might and could mean is kind of up for grabs among these different political actors. And interestingly, he is among the most pessimistic about the vitality of classics and whether they're worth doing. Um, and so one of his longest poems um, on the topic focuses very intensely on whether or not classical models can have vitality in, in this, I, I hesitate to say revolutionary because of Munoz Rivera's own politics, um, but in this more liberated um, Latin America that he inhabits. Um, oh, and this makes sense. Okay, so I was actually going to ask. So my understanding of classics is, of course, deeply informed by, I mean, even things like British textbooks. Like I, I learned out of the Cambridge Latin course in high school. And so I think in a lot of ways to study classics is to become very fond of the Romans and therefore to become very fond of empire. And to study what they're writing is to sort of accept a very imperial frame of mind and the idea of paideia and that universal imperial education. Um, you know, how do you as a revolutionary or as at least an autonomist, uh, you know, accept, I mean, especially because it sounds like a lot of these uh, writers are educated um, in a way that also prioritizes the classics. Like, how do you simultaneously use what you know? push back against it and then like what images do they do these posts find like different images more interesting than others um yeah i'm just so curious about all this <laughs> well i think one thing there and it's hard to speak universally to this um but to give you an example from betance's poem that i mentioned this this poem about elegists um right the poem is called the love of poets and it focuses very intensely on elegiac mistresses um, and one of its themes seems to be that these are, are misunderstood, um, people who are misrepresented by the sources that actually transmit them to us. Um, and in the world of this poem, they end up, you know, at one point in an article that I wrote about this, I sort of talk about how, um, there is basically this elegiac nightmare that like the only way you will be remembered is actually through the, as a poet is through, not through someone else's words, through the words of your mistress and like how she portrays you. And that's sort of the way that um, Betances does carry out his reimagining of this poet. Like he goes to the underworld and the voices of these women speak and they're actually the ones who, who say the names of these poets and sort of try to summarize uh, their poetic activity. Um, and so there's an inversion of power roles. And he, he explains at one point that they, they don't understand them. Um, that is to say that the elegists don't understand these, these women. Um, and they deprive them of uh, joy. Um, that is to say that they appear as joyless figures um, and that they're actually like full of life and vibrant. Um, and in that same piece, I, I talk about um, something that, that Derek Walcott says um, at one point 
in an interview, which he mentioned at one point in an interview, which is that if we actually saw Caribbean, or excuse me, if we actually saw Greek art now, we would think it was Caribbean art um, because it's so vibrant and full of color. Um, and it, but it's been sort of washed away of all of its color and all of its joy and is now sad and staid and boring. Um, but it actually wasn't. And that seems to be Patance's perspective in certain ways is that um, there is a lot of, there is a lot of joy that sort of has been squeezed out of these texts and squeezed out of this world um, because it is connected to dominant um, views. And that's sort of what Munoz Rivera also says uh, is that like, it's just too staid and boring to be vibrant. The image that he constantly returns to in his poem is he uses language like a gaucho, like the cowboy, um, like a cowboy subdues a horse. Um, that's how he, that's how he uses language. He wrestles it down. Um, and Plato is too boring and Virgil is too boring. He says at one point, um, I want the verse that sings and sobs that expresses this desire and, and longing and makes fun of, t of Tertius and Pindar and Dante. Um, and that's, that's what he can't get uh, from the classical tradition. So a lot of it is antagonistic, but at the same time, it's also replete with references to classical texts. This is a, this is a poem of Munoz Rivera as I'm moving to another author now. Um, and so not all of it is positive. Um, there are other places too, and I should, I should speak briefly to the work of others. Uh, there are other places too, where the Greek tradition is identified as kind of a, you know, a natural a point of resistance to Roman imperial dominance. And so poems from Greece, figures from Greece, poetry from Greece becomes important to many of these actors um, or to many of these political actors, I mean, who are also cultural actors. Um, and then there are also ways too where like uh, their own sort of struggle to, this is not a, not a theory of mine, but it's borrowed from somewhere else. Um, and it, indeed a different context entirely, somebody talking about uh, revolutionary America, um, but the idea that these sort of Roman values that appear in a lot of Roman exemplary texts are also theirs to inherit as military and political leaders. Um, so there are sort of uh, two, two different divergent ways of using material from the Greek and Roman past that appear in a lot of a lot of reception from Latin America. And one is this valorizing um, mode. Um, and and one is more of, uh, as I said, sort of a, um, identification with oppressed forces with in the classical sources that have come down to us, or outright hostility, uh, as you see in Munoz Rivera sometimes um, towards um, towards sort of canonical and classical authors. Oh man, it's really interesting. And I guess the reason I bring this up is because I like to think about reception um, in gaming terms. So I just wanted to hear about this work, but. I also think that, you know, across any sort of reception, right, any sort of repurposing of history or images, it's not just that the images are from a shared corpus, right? It's whoever is using them has a different perspective and an ability to kind of push in a direction that makes a different point. Um, and yeah, this is really, really interesting to hear. So... Yeah. yeah, that's a very famous theory of reception, right? That every text is rereading another text. So if you're um, if you're reading the Thebaid, you're actually reading the Aeneid with Statius. Um, if you're reading um, De Raptu Proserpina, you're actually reading Ovid's uh, Proserpina narratives with Claudian. Um, and uh, that is certainly the case 
in uh, something like the Amour de Poet, uh, for example, where Batansis is reading the corpus of Roman elegy, or at least talking about his experience of reading it, um, and what this is like, and what it might be like, and what the the fetishization of classics that he experienced in, in the 19th century was like, um, and how, and interestingly, by the way, uh, Betances is somebody who early in his sort of academic career won a bunch of prizes uh, for uh, Greek and Latin composition or um, translation or, or things like this when he was in, in school in France. Um, and that's why I sort of say that the fetishization, it was clearly an incredibly important part of his uh, education and sort of educational activity in his formative years before he went to university and eventually medical school in Paris. Yeah, well, it's really hard to push back and repurpose something that is inside you already and that has been like put there with a specific viewpoint by somebody else. I mean, you know, I, I feel that way about some of my own like early Latin education. And like, just out of curiosity, have you like reading these poems? I mean, you are in academia, which is as we all know, it's a little messy these days. Um, have you ever wondered if the classics is devoid of life? And if the sort of work that you're doing could perhaps breathe a little bit back in? Um, I certainly will not claim that I, I have the power to do anything um, um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, but I do not, I do not think uh, that um, I, I don't want to put put words in your mouth here. I believe the exact phrase is that classics is devoid of life. <laughs> um, and I think there will always, antiquity will always exert, um, you know, uh, or will always sort of uh, prompt fascination in various audiences. Um, and uh, whether that's through mythology or through history or through uh, the enduring sort of, you know, uh, traditions of uh, tragic drama that we continue to see recreated all the time. Um, uh, uh, so I am, you know, as confident as I've ever been that people are people are interested. Um, and to take things, you know, back to the gaming space, uh, we certainly see like uh, extremely fruitful sort of um, there's a there's a new game right now that you and I both don't know about uh, that is set in antiquity somewhere or somehow. Um, uh, one of the things that I have that I have put into the the classics in modern media class in the past has been the game Hades by Supergiant Games, uh, which is an extremely popular game. I think it won I don't know it won something fancy. People like it, um, and now there's going to be another one. Um, they're they're going to make a sequel to it, and as I understand it from reading the news article that I read about it, that studio has never made a sequel before, um, and their their only their their smash hit was this game that's set in the underworld, um, in the ancient in the ancient Greek underworld, and so and it, it's probably uh, the most sort of pop cultural touchstone for the Greek underworld since whatever the book is called, The Last Olympian, the one where Percy Jackson et al. go to the underworld. Sorry, <laughs> Percy Jackson fans. I don't actually know if that's right, but I know there is one where the underworld is important, and I think that's it. Um, yeah, I only so, read the first couple, so. <laughs> um, there, my, my siblings will, will hate me. Um, they're, they're huge. I'm the oldest, um, and was not, uh, introduced to those books as a kid and they all were. Um, and so they, they will all know, um, which is why I have this weird, <laughs> this information sort of on the periphery of my awareness. But the point is, um, you know, that's a thing that's drawing audiences, you know, to, to the ancient world in new and exciting ways. Uh, and this, we could say the same thing about, uh, whatever it's called, uh, Assassin's Creed. Yes. Uh, which, you know, brought a lot of interest into classical Athens um, whenever it came out, maybe like four years ago, the Athens one. Now there's a different one about Vikings and our 
our colleagues in the medieval medieval studies are, are having to deal with uh, the consequences of that series moving into their territory now. Um, <laughs> um, and so I think that those kinds of things will always draw people to the, the source material that inspired these things. Um, and, and maybe there's a better example that I'm missing that you could think of. Um, Actually, I want to wrap up with a different question, which is so sure. one of the reasons I do this podcast and one of the things I think games can do uh, is kind of help you see things in a different way or like help arrange things for you. So of the literature that you talk about, if somebody's going to read one thing that makes them see a myth or historical event through different eyes in a really striking way, uh, what would you recommend? Because I know you've read a lot of good poetry. <laughs> Um, how long can it be and how short can it be? Up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Ithaca by Kavafi gets me every time it is short. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. hmm. I don't know. That's such a hard question because, you know, as I was indicating to you before, everybody, uh, it's hard to prescribe a universally revelatory uh, experience because so many people... Um, have different interests. Then provide a um, personally rev revelatory experience. Because oh, that I, I can <laughs> probably do. Um, <laughs> um, I guess there I would maybe choose um, something my students have just seen, um, the Nakshi Rustam inscriptions um, from Iran. Um, these are inscriptions um, that were made by the Persian, the Sassanid Shahensha Shapur, after he destroys a ton of Roman field armies and has great success against the Romans. And um, Shapur appears on horseback with his huge dome crown that like depicts him as the most powerful being in the universe over a Roman emperor's body uh, in front of a pleading suppliant Roman emperors. Um, and you can see in that text the way that the Persian Shahedsha, the king of kings, uses Roman barbarians the way that Romans use barbarians in their iconography. And so if you want to see things from a different light, um, Matthew Canepa's The Two Eyes, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, The Two Eyes of Earth, which is about the relationship between um, late Roman and um, Persian power and how uh, that dynamic plays out, how they share court ceremonial, how they influence one another, contaminate one another, uh, and are sort of as the uh, that uh, title is taken from a letter of, uh, I think, Kusrau II um, uh, to Justinian, who he, he says that God created the world so that the Roman and the Persian emperors would be the two eyes of earth to illuminate the world for mankind, like the sun and the moon. Um, and so uh, there's, there's, there's much more to that relationship. And as you and I were saying at the beginning, there's often this way that non-Roman peoples appear in games, for example, and in popular culture as these one dimensional entities, which are there to oppose and get in the way uh, and obstruct Roman, Roman progress. And uh, I know this is a podcast, so, uh, you know, please note my scare quotes around the word progress. <laughs> um, but that's definitely not how they actually present themselves when we have a chance to look at their sources and uh, read read from their perspective. Uh, similarly, um, there are a number of really interesting sort of um, non uh, uh, non-classical uh, sources that can can do some of this stuff. Um, I am rereading R.F. Kuang's Babel. Oh God, uh, that was right my best now. book of last year. So good. Um, and so um, you know that is that is a really interesting perspective on learning Greek, for example, which the main character Robin Swift does. Um, and you know what it ends up being for, and how he slowly comes to terms with what it's for. Um, similarly, you could say the same thing about, uh, what is her name? Arkady Martin, a memory called Empire, um, which is a sort of sci-fi Byzantine empire uh, um, that she creates and, and exists in. 
Um, so yeah, um, like I said, um, there's someone in the audience for whom uh, all of the stuff that I said about uh, the Persian emperor and his relationship with Romans is completely banal and not exciting. Um, and they know that already, um, but there is someone for whom it's completely unheard of and totally new. Um, probably the same thing with um, uh, R.F. Kuang. Um, <laughs> many of your readers will already have read that book and, um, or not readers, listeners. Yes. Um, but if they haven't, they should. <laughs> All right. So, and then just, I know you have a meeting, so I just want to ask really quick. Uh, no, no if problem. people want to, if people want to ask you questions and, and look at your work and find you online, uh, where could you be found? Oh, I am kind of a Luddite in, in these terms. Um, so I think that the best way to do this is actually to email me um, at my, my Bowdoin email address. Um, and I am not on Twitter or anything like that um, or um, Instagram or I don't know, TikTok. Um, I, I, I barely exist uh, on the internet. And my Bowdoin email is j.hartman, my, my first initial and my last name at Bowdoin.edu. Fantastic. And those of you who are listening, hopefully know you can find me anywhere online as Beyond Solitaire. I am, in fact, terminally online. So uh, please like, subscribe, comment, ask questions, and most of all, happy gaming. Josh, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Bye, Liz. Thank you.